Aloha mai kako. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so what I wanted to do was take a look at, um, when we think of the Laku Okoa, um, one of the things that one of the things that the day celebrates is is relationships and connections. Um, Lakuokoa itself is the day that the French and the British agreed to have treaty relations with us um, on an equal status. And one of the things when I was trying to prepare this lecture, I was thinking about how um, it would be easy. There is a certain mindset, and it's kind of a Western mindset of independence means a lack of connection and independence means I am not tied to anything. I am free from everything. Um, and that kuokua, la kuokua is, is, is not. La kuokua is about our relationships. Um, and even after annexation, um, our relationships can help us define our, our independence. Our relationships can help us define kuokua um, as alahui or as individuals and I wanted to use um, some of the work that I've done on Native Hawaiian connections to other parts of the Pacific um, to talk about that. And specifically, I want to talk about John Baker. Um, John Thomas Hoa Baker, he was, um, his grandfather was Stephen Pupui. So he's one of the Tahitians that comes over as part of the missionary effort. Um, there's a number of Tahitians that come over, they become, um, they become, you know, ministers to uh, Kahumanu, ministers to Keopuolani, um, and they're very prominent. And um, John comes from, his, on his father's side, or his mother's side, his grandfather is this Tahitian guy, this Tahitian minister. His grand, and probably one of the more well-known ones during that time on Maui. Um, he could, basically by the 18, late 1820s, he could support himself from his church, where none of the Haole missionaries could, none of the Hawaiians were, were really allowed to have that kind of status. Um, but this one Tahitian minister was able to support himself um, and support a large church on Maui. And he marries a Hawaiian woman, um, and they have, they have um, a number of children, um, but one of them, um, Luca, marries, um, I keep screwing up the names. It's either Adam or Edward. Okay, sorry. Uh, marries Adam Baker. And they have a son that's an Edward. Um, so Adam Baker is a Howley ship captain. They have two kids. Um, he also has uh, children with... Um, I'm blanking on her name, and I'm super embarrassed because this is on camera. But Robert Hua Pili Baker is his, his half-brother. And then, um, so, John is, when the dad, the dad splits, and he comes back later and he wants, he wants the, the two boys to go with him to England and get an English education, and the mom tells him what he can do with his English education and his new English wife. Um, and she sends him to Lahaina Luna. He, um, at Lahaina Luna, he doesn't have a lot of money, but he's smart, he's good looking, and he's six foot plus. Um, so he, he attracts a lot of attention. Um, and he marries, um, right after graduation, Ululani Levi, who is a daughter of Noa, Noa Pele Iohulani, um, from the, the Kauai Pele Iohulani. So she's of, of high Ali'i um, status. She's an Ali'i Nui. He's there in the 18, in the 1870s. Um, this so this is later, yeah. So this is all, this is all happened in the 1870s. Um, her brother doesn't want to be in Kalakaua's court because he's a supporter of Emma. So he grabs the sister and puts her in the court. And um, John Baker is, he's working for John Cummins on a labor contract in Waimanalo on the plantation. And Kalakaua is, he feels sorry for Ululani because she, her husband is working, like she's in the court, her husband's working on the plantation. So she pulls him, or he pulls um, John out, brings him into the royal court, and he just really quickly establishes himself as a prominent part of the court. Um, 
part of it is he's good looking, he's outgoing, he's very, um, he's able to, to capture people's audience, or audiences really well. And he starts running for office. He's in the royal court, um, but he's also um, runs for the House of Representatives. And he picks up, he's able to scoop crowds from the independents. The independents were the, the mission faction. Um, he'll show up at their, he'll show up at their rallies, set up a box on the opposite end of the rallies, and just scoop their crowds over. And then he becomes Ululani, becomes royal governor of the Big Island. He becomes royal governor after her. And they're running the, um, after the overthrow, they're actually running the Hui Aloha Aina um, in Hilo. After annexation, um, he's kind of stuck. He's spent his entire life as a supporter of the Kalakaua dynasty. And, and the dynasty is, is out now. Um, he still has a large amount of land. Um, he's got a ranch. How many people are from Big Island? Any, any big, big Island people? So, you know, um, leaving Waimea, where Lakeland is, that whole paddock right after Lakeland on the way to Honoka'a, that was all Baker paddock. And then the ranch went all the way down into Hamakua. Um, so he's wealthy. He's an entrepreneur, um, but he's feeling lost because our independence is gone. And then in 1902, Ululani dies. And he's, then he's completely lost. Um, and he, seems, he flees Hilo. He can't live in Hilo anymore in their home in Hilo. He goes up to the ranch in Honoka'a. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do. And he goes, he decides to go on a trip. He goes to visit Tahiti. He's never been to Tahiti. That's his grandfather's land. And he'll leave in 1907, and he'll write back to Kealohaina. And he'll go to Tahiti, Samoa, Tonga, Rorotonga, um, Aotearoa, Fiji, Australia, uh, the Philippines and Japan. And we don't have, I can't find the, the ones for the Philippines and Japan, but everything else he's writing back home. And we have all those accounts in Kealohaina. And a couple of things that he starts noticing is, even though in the American empire we're set aside as, we are the exception. We are the, this weird part of an American empire. And we don't fit in because the language is different. The people are different. The culture is different. Um, all these things that the missionaries said marked the Hawaiians as, as you know, satanic in 1820 are the same things the Americans are marking the Hawaiians as archaic. And we're behind the times and we're not modern and we need to change so that we can be a proper part of America. What he starts to note is when he's going around, those are all the things that make us part of Oceania. Those are all the things that connect us. Um, when he's in Tahiti, he, first he runs into a bunch of Tahitians that have connections to Hawaii. Um, and then he starts running into Hawaiians that left and went to Tahiti. So he's getting into, he's, essentially he's welcomed into homes. And one of the things he talks about is the generosity, the amount of generosity that he receives. This is one of the things that Hawaiians were criticized for. And he'll criticize other Hawaiians for it because he's an entrepreneur, but Hawaiians aren't good at hoarding money. Like, we can't hoard money because someone who hoards money is not a good family member. They're not a good community member. Um, but he starts talking about the amount of generosity he receives down there. Um, so he's at a party with um, Levi, who is from Hamakua, I believe, had gone down and lived in, in Tahiti for a long time, marries into a Tahitian family. And he's at this party, he says, these are a good people, like us Hawaiians, an open bowl and an open gourd. The following was supplied, raw fish, yams, ahi poke, taibero, um, kalo, sweet potato, banana, breadfruit, coconut, chicken, and pig. Above us, the table, below the people, the table was covered in haoli's. It was much like our parties, standing and offering the bottle before eating, saying, here is the food, it has been prepared. Eat and drink without unease, and talk together with our happiness on meeting each other. Aohe no vehena mai akako. There is nothing that separates us. 
The thing that he finds over and over again is that there's nothing separating us. The space between us is a connection. The space between us and the Tahitians is a space of connection. It's not a space of distance. The space between, even, you know, he goes to Aotearoa, he expects, he knows enough about Tahitians, there's enough Tahitians in Hawaii. He knows he'll be able to speak Olelo Hawaii and he'll be able to understand when Tahitians speak back to him. He goes to Aotearoa and he finds the same thing. He's on a train and he just, he's just Olelo. Everything is in Olelo. They're, they're anti him in Te Reo Maori. They can all speak English, but they're making the connection because they don't have to. Um, and even there, he's saying the same thing. There's nothing that separates us. There's 2,000 miles. There's how many hundreds of years of genealogical distance. Um, and there's nothing separating us. Um, and so he's, he makes the same arguments about you know, language. Language is the thing that marks us out as, as not a proper part of the American empire. It's the thing that marks us out as part of Polynesia. It's the thing that marks us out as connected to the, to the Maori to the Maori. Um, he, um, he talks about land a lot. He talks about the land in a way that um, is to familiarize his audience. So when he describes lands, he'll often associate them with places. He'll say like, oh, this, this island is like Molokai, except it's flatter. Or he'll say, you know, this area is just like, um, you know, this area is just like Ka'u except there's this distance, and this difference, and this difference. But one of the things he's doing is he's, he's connecting his audience, so it's not a distant foreign land. He's telling them, these are the lands that you, you, know, you are Aloha Aina. You're reading Ke Aloha Aina. These are the lands you love. These are the lands that connect us in many ways to other people in, in Oceania as well. Um, and in some places, he's, he, you can see this. And, I've experienced this too, like you're in some place in, in Oceania, you're in Aotearoa, or you're in Fiji, and you come upon a, a space or some land and you just see it, and you don't, you don't remember that you're somewhere else because you think you're home. Um, there's things that are different, um, but there's still this, this like something that's the same. Um, and it connects him in some places. Um, in a really deep level. He's talking about when he's off of Savai'i, and he talks about Savai'i, Hawai'i. Like, this is a good name for this place, Savai'i and Hawai'i. Like, it's, it feels like the same place. Um, and he says, I'm reminded of Aimea, and I thought of us covered in the fog, and I'm seeing the forest of Mahiki to deposit the bones of the one I love. I begin to sing with loving tears. How will this, um, how will this end? That we too meet and pulse within, um, uh, pulse within the fog. Oh, you, um, oh, sorry. That we too meet and pulse within. Oh, you, um, oh, the embrace. Oh, to see the things that I see. Um, and he has, a, he has a locket of Ululani. And he opens up the locket and there's an image of Ululani in there. And he's sort of, he's sharing this moment, this incredibly intimate moment with his audience at home weeping and thinking about Ululani, but when he thinks about Ululani, he thinks about the, the forest they've gone through. He thinks about depositing her bones in the land, and Savai'i makes him think of those, those places. It makes him think of Ululani. And he's, look, he's a smart guy. He knows one of the things he's doing rhetorically is he is connecting his audience to him, and he is connecting through him, he's connecting his audience to those places. Um, and he does this numerous times. That's the one that that's the one that every time I read it, I'm like, Whoa. that one kind of hurts. Like, just imagining that moment of, of seeing Savai'i, seeing Hawai'i, and immediately thinking of Ululani. Um, there's other things that, that he's noting. Um, again, one of the things that has always distinguished Hawaiians culturally was hula and oli and mele, um, and that important place that it plays where it's not, that it's, it's part of the culture. It's an important part of how Hawaiians saw themselves. And there's all that effort in the 19th century to strip that out of Hawaiians. And it fails, right? But that effort was there and that pain is there. And it's still that, that sense of like, this is the thing that, that makes us a, a bad fit for the American empire. If we want to be good Americans, if we want to be good subjects of this empire, that has to be sort of erased. Um, 
But everywhere he goes, he takes his guitar, and from the description, it sounds like they're describing it as a new thing, and it sounds like he, he's playing slack key. Or actually, he's probably playing steel guitar. Um, he talks about a booming sound. And they're like, oh, this is a new kind of guitar. And he's sharing sort of kingdom era music and Oli and Mele. Um, and everywhere he goes, he, he kind of has his guitar and he's like, oh, I don't want to. Oh, OK, if I must. And he picks it up and he starts playing. And he likes to entertain. He likes to share. And he goes to um, Faka Reo Rewa um, in Aotearoa. It's up. Um, as part of this sort of already well-known tourist route. And you, you still go there today. It's, it's a volcanic area. Um, and this one, this one village has, they still live there. But they also have this like rotating tourist trade that goes through and keeps kind of keeps the town afloat. Um, and so he goes, to the, he goes to the show. And he sees, you know, he's with a bunch of tourists, and he sees them. They go and they're, they're dancing, and he's describing it, and he's saying, I don't really understand all that. Like, their aesthetic is different. He's very, he's like, they're flaring their tongues a lot, and I'm not really sure I like this aesthetic, but I like this thing that they're doing. And he talks about the tattoos, and like, I think the tattoos are very beautiful. But he's not looking at it as a tourist spectacle. He's talking about it as somebody who participates and deeply has this deep appreciation for Pula for Mele, for Oli, and he's seeing it as, this is something that I know, but it's a very different version. And the same thing when he's in Tahiti, he says, oh, they do this different, they do this different. He's definitely sort of a Hawaii, he's a nationalist, so he's like, they have, like Tahiti, they dance great. They're not quite at the Molokai level. They're like not, they're almost there, they're very good, but they're not quite there. Um, and yes, there's a, there's a Hawaiian exceptionalism of, he says like, you know, they, they shake with a fury and like they're burning off all the fuel, but the Molokai people, they're just a little bit better at this, or the, the Lanai people do this particular thing better. Um, and then the, the, after the, the performance in Whakareo Rewa, um, the dancers come into the crowd and they're like, basically they're like, Maori, what are you doing here? Um, and he's like, oh, hey, Hawaii. And because there's a Hawaii, the term was probably first, actually, who knows far, how far back, but um, Raiatea probably was, was where initial voyages for us came from, the initial voyages for them came from, and the old name for Raiatea is Hawaii, um, or Hawaii, Hawaiiki. Um, so they're asking him, like, oh, you're from the, the land of the, the Kupuna, you're from the bones of our ancestor. And so, he, he understands that he's going to be able to, he's already been welcomed by enough Maori down there that say that, and he knows there's, a, there's an expectation of, of extra generosity for other islanders, but for the Maori, they had this especially strong um, sentiment towards, towards Hawaiians. And so they see the guitar, because of course he brought his guitar, and they're like, oh, show us some of your, your, your music and dance. And at that moment, it, it stops being a spectator thing. It stops being a show and it's an exchange and he plays for them and then they're like oh you know he's talking about you know how much how you know this sort of outpouring of love back and forth through Pula and then he leaves um, he goes to his hotel goes and does some other tourist stuff that day and then that night another um, another Maori community comes and grabs him and is basically like oh you have to come with us and then that night they're like, so we heard, we heard you're from Hawaii. We heard you know, you know how to haka. And he's like, well, let me show you. And he breaks out of the guitar, he plays music, and then he dances for them. And then it happens the third day is a Sunday. He goes to an Episcopal church or an Anglican church ceremony. And then he, um, he goes and there's a pofiri, a sort of welcoming ceremony. He goes to a pofiri. And the same thing. It's, it's, they want, they, they're not just interested in this Hawaiian, but this Hawaiian that's coming and showing them the same thing that they're being sort of like, you're, you guys do haka and it's okay in a tourist thing, but you guys need to kind of stop that sort of thing because it's modern New Zealand. And this Hawaiian is coming and the same thing, he's facing the same thing, but when they're there together, that's the, that's the reason there's ahe, ahe no vehana, like there's nothing separating us because, because look at this, look at these ties and connections. Um, and I've seen these all over the place. And this is one of the, 
the things that he is constantly sort of pushing in the newspapers. We are tied so closely to everybody else in the Pacific. We are not an isolated part of the American empire. We are tied in part of this broad Lahui. Um, and he doesn't use the term Lahui to describe it, but what he's creating is this, this sense of a broader Lahui that our Lahui is a, an aspect of. Um, sorry, how much time? I just want to make sure I... It's 11.05. Okay, shoots. Um, So the other thing, though, is, like I mentioned, he's a, like he's a proper Lahaina Luna grad for the 1870s. He is a, he is a devout capitalist. Like, he believes in capitalism. He, um, he'll actually get some, he'll get some leases from Kalakaua. Um, because of his support, he gets leases for, um, where is it in Hilo? Um, kind of upland Hilo above the prison area. Um, and he's, um, from those, he has his own, his own operations, his own egg operations. He has, he's subleasing to other farmers. Um, he's constantly looking for new sources of wealth. Um, and that's how he ends up with the ranch up in Waimea. Um, and he's remembered, he's kind of remembered as, they call him like, a, even though he's not an Ali, but he's remembered as a stingy Ali because people would ask him for help and he'd be like, here's a job. And they'd ask him for, and he's always kind of like, you know, we have to be Hawaiians. He's always encouraging Hawaiians to be proper. Like we need to be embracing capitalism. When they open the Kohala ditch, he gets up and gives an impromptu speech, um, just kind of standing on top of the ditch about how like Hawaiians, we have to do more. We have to do more of this. We have to sort of embrace more capitalism. We have to build more, um, develop more. And he actually, on his voyage, he's, when he's talking to other islanders, um, he's, he's constantly pushing this. Um, and he talks to, um, when he meets other islanders like himself who are, who are entrepreneurs, he meets uh, Hiremi uh, Tevaka, Tevake, who's um, Fina Cooper's father um, down in Aotearoa. So she's a pretty prominent, um, sort of part of their, their independence movement um, and the land movements down there. And he, he celebrates um, him because he's, he's so wealthy. He's like John Baker. Um, and he, he talks about him. Um, he makes jokes throughout his, what he's writing because a lot of the audience will know who he is. Um, he makes jokes about how, how deaf he is. And he doesn't mean literally deaf, he means kulipa'a. He's deaf to the, the cries of other people. He's, he's greedy. He, and he, he kind of is like, well, that's, that's proper capitalism. Um, I can't just give out money, because then I won't have capital. Um, and he talks about, um, when he talks about um, Tuake, he says, he's a, a rich and well-supplied person like, um, like John Baker. Um, Um, I know. So, oi aku kapa'a okoya um, ne kuli i ko'u. Um, his kuli is even more pa'a than mine. He is even deafer than I am. He is even sort of more miserly than I am. Um, and he's. He knows his audience is reading this and they're like, there's a negative connotation that he knows is there, but at the same time, he's kind of goading them towards like, this is, this is what we have to do. We have to be this to survive in this new empire. And he's always, he's always pushing for small scale, native owned entrepreneurial, capital, like agricultural capitalism. Um, so he's, everywhere he goes, he's like, we could do this, we could do this. Um, he sees the coconut, he sees copra, and he's like, oh, we should, we should plant copra. There's lots of places we could plant copra. There's money to be made in copra. Um, when he's in Aotearoa, he sees the money they're making off of flax. He says, we can make money off of flax. Like, we got to grow this. Um, he sees the sheep ranching in, in Australia, and he's like, Waimea needs more sheep. Like, we can definitely have more sheep in Waimea, and we can make money. Um, and yeah, it's, he's, a, he's a good 
Lahaina Luna grad of that era, right? He's looking to have like more capitalism because he sees it as the thing that's kept him, and this is where it gets to independence. It's the thing that kept him independent. When he's the, when he's a, you know, anti-annexation leader in Hawaii, or in Hilo, he's rich. They can't break him by taking away his mortgages. He doesn't have mortgages, right? They can't break him because he's wealthy and he sees that as part of his independence. But at the, at the same time, because he sees that independence, he's blind to some of the problems there, right? And it's not that he doesn't know that they're there, he's purposely blind to them. And um, at one point, he's, um, he's in Tahiti. This is so on the first part of the voyage, and he's traveling with this, this other Hapa guy named um, Poro'i, um, who's a Hapa Tahitian guy. And they're traveling to, um, to Taravao, which is, it's like a peninsula, it's a neck, what's it called, an isthmus. Um, between these two parts of Tahiti and while he's traveling through it, it's just like it's green and it's lush and it's beautiful and why aren't there more coconut trees planted like it's a beautiful area it's clearly like and he says um, he talks about him he says you know the the people there are they're lava they're sufficient everything like they have everything they need they're lako they're well supplied but I don't understand why don't they, they don't akinui after the dollar. And he's writing this after the fact, so he may be sort of building this up. He says, I don't understand why don't they akinui after the dollar? Why don't they have, not just ake desire, but like akinui, like their liver is pained because they want money. And that, that akinui is the heart of capitalism and it's the heart of the thing that's going to allow us to be, have some economic independence in this future. Like our political independence is gone, we need economic independence and akinui is the thing that's going to give it to us. Um, so he asked, he asked, he asked Poroi, you know, how come when I'm going through here, you guys, you guys basically are planting enough crops to eat, a little bit of vanilla or copra on the side so that you have a little bit of spending money, but you guys could make money down here. There's so much land. It's not developed. It's so lush. Why don't you guys, and like, you guys have time. I see you guys have time. Make money. Um, and he says, you know, how come you, where's, Peheaka Akinui Ole, right? How come there's no Akinui? Um, and and um, Poro'i turns to him and he says, You Hawaiians have many dollars and progress, and are you not slaves and, sa uh, sorry, slaves and servants for the dollars? Perhaps you do not rest. Perhaps your lands go to the haole and your Akinui for the dollar. Ho'olako mai keakua, right? God has provided for us. Um, Amehe um, la pe la no oko, and, and for you also perhaps, um, with the banana growing and flowering year round, kalo growing for you to fetch as you can, here is the yam, there is the breadfruit. Why overburden and ruin your body for the dollar? For what reason? It is lava to have some convenient money. And this is the first time, like, in any account I've ever read of John Baker where he, he's quiet. And he actually writes back, he shut me up. And this is a guy who, like, during the elections, would just set up a box and steal a crowd. And he's shut up. And he's kind of, like, knocked back. And it's, this is not a new thing. This is not something he hasn't heard before from Hawaiians, right? But hearing it in Tahiti, when he's in this space where he's making these connections and he's seeing how, how broad our connections are, that's the thing that, that breaks it into his head for him. He's like, oh, it's not just us. It's this broader thing. Um, and he starts thinking about lava. Um, and he, he actually, he presses and pushes a little bit more. He's like, well, you know, if you make a little bit, if you guys, if you guys go and, and work for money, like, you know, you have more, you can go and buy stuff. And he's actually, he says, yeah, but where we get food? And he says, well, we, you can always go buy food. And he goes, so let, just to get this straight, you want me to go work for some Haole guy so I can go and take that money and buy food from some Haole guy. And again, he's just like, oh, that's, you do have a good point. Um, and then he's, he, he tells the crowd, he remembers um, his grandmother. Um, his grandma helped raise him, and he talks about his grandma praying over him and saying, I want, like, God, make, make sure this child is um, never so poor that he steals, 
but never so wealthy that he forgets about the, the glory of the Lord. And he tells, Poroi actually tells him a parable that is based on a Greek, um, it's a Greek story of one of the, the Greek cynics. And I'm not sure where Poroi got the desire to translate this into a, a Tahitian parable. But he's, he talks about this, um, an ali'i who hears that someone is living in his area is living in a barrel. And he goes to the guy and he says, why are you living in a barrel? Like, I, what, what do you need? I can, I can get you a job. I can do, like, it's embarrassing for me that someone in my, my lands is living in a barrel. And the guy says, oh, Ali, if you could move your head a little bit to the left, you're, you're blocking the sun. <laughs> and it's, 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 but it's the same sort of thing. It's like, why we don't have to continually chase. It doesn't, we don't have to chase um, because when we're chasing, we're missing everything else. Um, and he says, it's, it's okay to be lava. His grandmother taught him to be lava. And his grandparents worked until they were lava. When they're fine, when they're sufficient, everything, that's when you stop, that's when you stop working and that's when you start paying attention to other things, right? So you're not constantly chasing the dollar, you're not constantly chasing things, you're constantly chasing whatever you need to make you lava. And if that's money, that's money. If it's connections to other people, it's connections to other people, if it's your family, um, it's those connections to your family. And like in this case, like if it's being here, then it's being here. If this is what's gonna make us lava, then this is the thing that's making us lava. Um, the other thing, and this is, so this is just kind of me riffing off of this, is looking at lava allows us, that's one of the things, like looking for connections. Our independence is partly based on our connections because those are, those are resources that we can call on. Our independence is partly based on our family, on our lahui, et cetera. Um, and one of the connections that Baker is finding that, that is actually incredibly important for him in this moment after annexation, when our political independence has been taken, is these connections to Oceania and this, this reminder from Poro'i way, way down in Tahiti um, about the lessons his grandma taught him, right? And that, those are lessons of independence. It's when you're lava, then you, can, you don't have to continue to chase to the point that you lose your lands. We can, we can look for lava. We can look for that level. Um, and he'll, he'll reflect on this in his, his writings back to the newspaper. He'll, he's interviewed by a Maori newspaper and he, he tells them about the story. There's an English language interview when he comes back in the Gazette, tells that story again. And it doesn't change him to the point that he's no longer a capitalist. He will continue to pursue wealth. Um, but it's something that he, he will constantly sort of be forced to reflect on. Um, in Rarotonga, he's, he says, you know, the, the man is um, Moeloa and the, the wahine is um, Nanavale, right? The man just sleeps and the, the women look around, they're lazy. But then at the same time, one of the things he has to start thinking about is like, yeah, but they're also well supplied. Like they are lava. So he's, he's, com he's, yeah, he's constantly sort of combating that within himself. Um, and even though like, look, he, he's still gonna be a capitalist. One of the things that he, he really quickly, because he's, he's a good speaker, he's a sharp, he's good at rhetoric, is he looks at that and he sees, this is the critique of empire that we kind of were making, but now being in other places, seeing the other empires doing the same thing, seeing these other people who are lava and had their things taken away from them, those, that's gonna help him um, form a, a stronger critique of empire um, from a broader Pacific perspective. Um, oh shoot, sorry. I gotta go back one step. I, I forgot this, I really like this quote. So he's a, he's a clothes horse. Like he is definitely very proud of clothing. Um, he's, he talks, like he's, he's wealthy. He looks good in a suit. The, um, the Kamehameha statue is actually based on a picture of him wearing um, Kamehameha's actual regalia, right? So that's him. And then they, they actually copy paste legs onto him that might be Robert Hope, Peely Baker's legs. There's different accounts, but like he's a good looking guy. He looks good in a suit. Um, and he's always talking about how proud he is in his clothes. And in, this is a very sort of 19th century Hawaii thing. He's, he's always picking out, and I've seen other Hawaiians do this, like, oh, these other Islanders don't wear hats, 
And like, that's kind of like, I don't know, they're not, they don't have hats. Like, where's your hats? Um, and he, uh, after Poroi kind of pushes back on him, he says, he's, he's walking around on uh, and he says, of their clothes, the men wear white clothes, a white coat, no shirt, and an undershirt, um, done like the clothes of a Marine. The women with pretty clothes, but no shoes. These islands are very pleasant and calm. We really are slaves and servants to the dollar of the haole and the toil of work. Right? And he's starting to, it's making him reassess. The thing that's making me independent might, the thing that I think is making me independent economically might be the thing that's making me dependent culturally. Um, and also like, it's actually pulling me deeper into that system, not separating me from it. Um, so I really like that quote and I skipped it. So I just wanted to go back to it. Um, and then he goes, yeah, so he's, he, he instantly starts talking. While he's in Tarawa, he's talking to the, the Mohia and he sa starts saying, you know, we used to be Lava, we used to be Lako, and then we were taught not to do that and we had our lands taken from us. We had everything taken from us. Um, and he starts talking about, you know, the generosity that I'm experiencing here. This is the generosity that we gave because we expect that in our families. We expect generosity, and, but we also expect that to come back. And it's not an exchange, it's just that's the spirit that is supposed to be, like the spirit of giving is supposed to be there constantly. Um, and he says, many are the haole that came to us destitute, cared for by Kanaka. We ate together, slept together, and after these haole get rich, these haole are never seen again, right? And so he's saying, you know, we look for lava, we look for our general, be able to have enough to, to support each other, to be generous. But then the people that came were not doing that, right? Um, and the empire, like, on a broader scale, the empires are not doing that as well. Um, so later on, he's, um, because he's pretty wealthy, he's traveling and he travels in different circles. So he's traveling with sort of wealthy elite circles, but then he also just shows up at, like, if there's a Hawaiian someplace, he's going to show up there. He's showing up in people's homes because they're inviting him in. Um, and he ends up talking to this guy, um, Humphrey Berkeley, who is a British judge in Fiji. And um, basically, uh, Berkeley is pushing him on like, you know, who, you know, the importance of empire and how great the empires are and everything. And like, you've, you've traveled all around the world because he's actually traveled to Europe, he's traveled to the US before. And now you've traveled throughout the Pacific, you know, where are the best places and, you know, the, Clearly, it's, it's England. Clearly, it's the empires. Um, and it says, actually, no, it's... You guys came here and kind of ruined everything. It's your, it's your, your greed that forced you to do this. Um, and he says, you know, you guys had everything you needed. You didn't need to come here. You could come. We would welcome you. But you didn't need to come and take everything. Um, and so he, he actually starts explaining lava to Berkeley. He says, here are the, imit, uh, the limits of eating. To go until you're a lava. It is enough. Finish and rest. And there is a limit to the meal. There is a limit to all things. In our way of thinking, or in our way of living, one is to become satisfied. One is to become lava, then stop and rest. I think we, and he's talking specifically about Kanaka Hawaii, but he's also kind of talking about the Pacific in general. I think we are an enlightened nation in our, own, in our way of life. To love, to share the things you have, to be pleasant and not greedy. If one sees a little dog with bones and a big dog with a piece of beef, that one, the big dog, is not satisfied, but it will fetch the bone of the little dog. This is how it looks at all things. There is no love inside of that one. This is how I see the Lahui Keo Keo. If you and I look at Hawaii and at Fiji, there are no small nations like Fiji and Hawaii that have been freed from empire. Hawaii is in America, Tahiti is in France, Rarotonga, Fiji, New Zealand, and Tonga, and so forth in Britain. Samoa is in Germany and many others. So he's taking that idea of lava and he's aiming it right back at them. And he's saying, look, you guys came here and you kind of, if you read the, the sort of rhetoric, all the empires come in, they say we're taking over because you aren't civilized. You don't have all our, like you don't have all the things that we think you should have. So we're gonna have to come take all your land and give you the things we think you should have. Like, I mean, syphilis and capitalism. Um, and it's because you're, you're deficient, right? And what he's saying is actually the, the problem is that the empires are deficient. You, don't, you have no limits. You don't understand lava. There's a limit to everything. You eat until everything is gone. And then you eat your neighbor's food. And that's not, 
lava, that is, that's akinui, that's greed, that's destructive. And we understand that there's something that's driving you guys. Um, and that thing is, that thing is, it's unsafe. It's unsafe for the world. And he says, you know, I, I've gone to all the nations. And what I see, what I see in your, your great nations are, are people starving on the streets. And um, Kalakala talked about this before. And in, um, when he travels around the world, he says, you know, and he actually kind of echoes Kalakawa's words. And he says, I think Hawaii is the, the best of the nations um, because no one is starving on the streets. And we have hats. <laughs> because he is kind of fascinated with hats. And that's just that's the 19th century. I don't understand 19th century fashion. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, um, that's kind of where we are now. We're, we're at a point that we, we don't have our political independence, right? But there's these other ways that we can start looking for independence. And one of them is like economic independence, environmental independence, the ability to control our land. And part of it is understanding lava, right? The job, like that thing is gonna bring jobs. But at a certain point we have to say, okay, we are lava, we have enough to eat. Do we need a telescope up there? Do we need 16 more new hotels down on, the, on that side, right? At a certain point, when do we see lava? Um, and lava is one of the things that can help us find our independence in other ways. Because when we're lava, we don't spend time searching narrowly for one thing. If we have Akinui, we're searching for that one thing. If we're, you know, if we are not Lako, if we're not supplied, we're searching for that one thing. But once we're supplied, once we're lava, we can start looking around and we can have a better understanding of everything that's moving around us. Um, and John Baker didn't realize, I, he knew this. His grandma prayed over him and said the same thing, right? But it's actually making those connections to other places and seeing them go through the same struggles and seeing the, that the same ideas that we have are the same ideas that they have and that they, they have relevance, that they can work. Um, I think that's one of the, the most important things we can do. And we, we're looking across the Pacific. We can, part of it is helping each other out in our struggles, but part of it also is just seeing the similarities, seeing the places where um, our ideas are the same, and seeing the power of those ideas when we recognize them as part of a broader Lahui. Um, and I'm going to kind of tie it off there. So any questions? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Any any questions? So tell me again this, the way they frame this term lava. Mm -hmm. How do you see it as instrumental in moving us beyond where we are now? So in terms of how can we use lava to help motivate contemporary points today yeah. into the movement towards whatever they see as the pursuit of their own sovereignty, be that climate justice, be that the production of food, sovereignty, security, which of course means different things to different people mm. in different forms. How would you frame lava as part? Because that's almost like, should be the crux of decolonization, right? I, yeah. The idea of enough for sustenance of all kinds, mm. while it aligns with enough is enough. Yeah, and like, Part of it is, I mean, part of it's the material part of lava, right? I mean, do I need a new truck? Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. that has to come in, it's gonna, when, when we think about lava, we, we, like, part of it is that material side. That's gonna root us deeper into the economic side. And the more money, the more you're in debt, or the more money you're spending, the more you need that job, right? The more you are dependent on it, the more you can't come because, I don't have tenure yet and I gotta make sure that yeah. I show up for work and right. you know, like, so it's, there's that material side, but yeah, also the idea of just like, maybe we should learn to be lava in, in the connections we have. Like, not, not the sense that we shouldn't make more connections, but like understanding that like, there's that, lava is, is a point where you're happy and you're satisfied. Yeah. And like, going back and realizing those, those Having those moments where, like, like more simpler, like simpler, but also like connected, like yeah. it's kind of like being, yeah, this, yeah, like. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah. This is Lum. We're at the Just like three very appreciated meals a day. Yeah. And then we have three very appreciated meals a day. And then what do we spend the rest of our time doing? Ceremony. Mm. <laughs> And it's it's that Diogenes, the guy, this, the Greek guy's name was Diogenes. But it's that stopping and like we don't need like in this case the lee is like capitalism and empire. But like move over to the side a little bit. We're lava. Like I'm from Waimea, and I left I left for college, and I I was 17, so I was like I can't wait to get out of here. And ever since then, it's been like, well, I, I wish I could go back. And there's all these things that I want to go back and enjoy. And when I go home, I can enjoy it. But, but there's all these other things that I'm trying to get and pursue. And I miss out on, on the ability to just simply enjoy it, right? Like sitting, like sitting down by Waiaka stream and just being by the stream, that kind of sense of lava that kind of sense of rootedness and groundedness. And like for Aloha Aina, like that's a, that is part of it. It's when you feel like, when you're connected, <laughs> when you feel like this is enough and I don't have to do anything to this land in order to feel sufficient here. Right. Yeah, when you, and like you, it's like, like the more I, st it's a, like when you, and like you have to be, because you can be the big dog and never, never be lava. Because you just, it's understanding there's an internal limit of this is what I need and I'm happy with myself and I'm happy with my connections and I'm happy with my lahui. And we can concentrate on, on the places where we're not happy and building those things instead of just constantly pursuing and pursuing and pursuing and pursuing. <laughs> Like when you're talking about that, like you have enough for you and you're sharing out. But then those connections, the sharing out is one of the things, those connections are one of the things that makes you lava as well. Like that's one of the things that, that grounds you and makes you, like when you share, is like you feel, right? It's like there's that, like the aloha that goes out and the aloha that, like it's just that, yeah. And that when we're, when we're not doing that, then we've lost that. And actually, that's one of the gaps. That's, like, that's one of the places that you become not lava when you're pursuing money, is that you, you, you lose that. Oh, sorry. Uh, it seems like John Baker had like, a really sharp critique of empire, but like, why do you think like, he never just extended that exact critique to capitalism? Do you think it was because he was too rich, or like, I think he, he, he like, might have. Like, he might have had a little investment. He might have had a little investment in capitalism. I, I mean, you know, by the time this is happening, he's in his fifties. It's hard to make someone's like shift, especially. And he, he is pretty. Um, like he's, even though he's a cap, like he's very smart about not going too. Like he talks about, he's like one of the reasons him and Teoke get along really well is they're both native landowners who are like never sell land, right? And he's like, oh, you can't sell land. Don't cut down your trees, gather the fruit. So he's, he's, his capitalism that he imagines is actually like, there is some lava in there. Um, but at the same time, he's, and like, it's very hard for him to distance himself from that. I mean, it's, he's a successful, like he's a very successful capitalist. So it's hard to separate himself off completely. 
And probably seemed more manageable back then too, before it's kind of like reached this crisis yeah. point. <laughs> well, he, well, he talks about the number of people he knew in Hilo that, that lost all their money going into Sure. So what he's, he's, he's big on like, okay, find ways to, actually for a capitalist, he's not big on capital. <laughs> Is, is 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 sweat capital so he and this is he's got a blind spot there too because he's always like oh just work really hard and it'll come and it's like well you worked really hard but you also were part of the royal court yeah. and kalakao like you hooked him up with land yeah. there's no question so it's like he's a little blind there but he's i think he's trying to come to grips with it and seeing as like well if if you avoid over you know avoid debt avoid that kind of thing but he's he's not gonna leave it behind completely there's a reason he's able to go on a six-month tour to <laughs> Oceania and go on the nice boats too <laughs>